does that mean? So what we're going to do today is we're going to build another sort of basic Rails application, uh, but we're going to look closely at the routing system. And so uh, in the past, we've, we've, we looked at sort of the basics of creating a Rails application by way of scaffolding, and we were able to like, you know, do the various cred tests by way of a scaffolded app. We also looked at sort of how you could build a Rails application up more from scratch, where you first created uh, a model and then a controller and then having the routes set up to route to the controllers. We had our Pokemon app that worked in that manner. Uh, we're now going to create another Rails application and to look more closely at routing and specifically how to link to the various routes that we might have in our application. Um, and so I'm in the Vagrant system right now and to go to my Vagrant folder, navigate to my Rails folder, and I'm going to do a Rails new, and I will just create a simple store. You might have something in there called simple store, so you could just call it store. And it doesn't matter if capital, or capital letters aren't needed on there? Uh, it should just be all lowercase. Rails, new, and then the name of the project. If you already have something called Simple Store, you can call it something else. Whoa. You might from, that's what I had uh, you use in the challenge, I believe. So you might already have a Simple Store. So once we've done that, we can see that we have our folder named after whatever you used after the new command. And I'm gonna navigate to that folder I can see that this is already a Git repository, so I will add the, uh, the existing files with the git add dot command. That'll recursively add all the files and folders. And then I can git commit uh, first commit of a new Rails app. So what we want to do is we're going we're gonna to build up, again, all of the, the pieces by hand. We're going to make a model. We're going to make a controller. And then we're going to look at some of the routing. Uh, last time with the Pokemon, I did model controller. But we didn't do any routes. We simply had one and only one view. It was like an index view. And we were, from the controller, fetching data from the model and displaying it in that one and only view. Uh, but now we want to be able to have different pages in our application. So we'd like to be able to have, for example, for this simple store, maybe a home page that lists all of the products in the system and then the ability to link to any one of those products and get a page for just that product, uh, maybe with more details on it. So that means I'm going to start by creating a model and work my way up to the, uh, the other aspects of the application. So from I have my three different folders open here. From this one, this is where I'll be running my Rails server. So I'll just leave the, the server up and running. I'm hoping that I'll have time later today to record another quick video to demonstrate how to edit in Atom over an SSH tunnel rather than editing an atom by way of the shared vagrant folder. Uh, if you only use the shared vagrant folder, you will get frustrated in that you will have to restart your server more often than I have to restart my server because I am editing through that SSH tunnel. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you know today when uh, server restarts are likely required. I won't have to do them and then later on today if I'm I think we'll have some time. I can do a quick demo on how to set that SSH uh, tunnel up so that you can avoid having to restart that server. So I've got my server up and running. We can test to see if things are good by pulling up localhost colon 3000 in the browser. And it should give us our welcome. We are on Rails message, which it does.
So back over here, I'm going to navigate in another one of my uh, tabs back to that same new folder. And same over here. Vagrant Rails Simple Store. And I want a model, and so I'm going to use my Rails command to G for generate the model. So Rails G model, and then this is a simple store, so this is going to follow the pattern that you used for the to, for the last challenge, except for in the last challenge you used scaffolding. So we're going to go it from another angle here. So I'm going to say Rails generate uh, model product, and my product is going to have a name, which will be a string, a description, which will be a text blob, and so. In the database, the string is going to become a varchar, and the text will become a column of type text. And I will also bring in a very simple way of doing images, which will be, uh, we'll look at sort of more complex ways of bringing images into a Rails app later in this course, but a very simple way might just to be have a image URL, which is a string, where we could save the URL to a particular image and have that display for us. And I think that's all I will have. Well, I guess we should have a price, right? Products uh, price, and the price will be a decimal amount. Name, string, description text, image URL string, price, decimal, colons between the name and the type, and spaces between each one of those name type pairs. It's very specific, oh, yeah. I had to read those down for like eight times. Because you did like commas or, or yeah. yeah. So you have to do things the Rails way or else it just will not work. And so pressing enter here, we will generate that model. That generates for us a migration, which will create the products database table. It generates for us a, our product model, which is in the app models folder. And so I can run my migration by saying Rails DB migrate. And that will go and run this migration right here. And if everything works well, I should see some output saying that a table was created, a table named products. If I want to know more about uh, my database schema, I can always look at, in the DB folder, the schema.rb file. So the cat command in Linux will display a file for me. And so I can hit enter there. And I can see now in my schema that we have this products table. And it looks like I expected, right? It's got the string column called name, the text column called description, the image URL, the price, and then the created at and updated at timestamps that I don't need to specify. Those just come for free. Uh, all tables will also have the primary key ID, which is not specified here. Just know that they always have an ID column, which is the auto-incrementing primary key. Okay, that's all well and good. We now have that going. We have that model going. So I can git add and git commit minus m added a product model and migrated the db. Yes. I'm recording this as a video, so you'll, you could be, see it as a video, but I don't have notes for this. This basically follows the, uh, the intro Rails tutorial, so if you've, if you've done that or if you want to do that, it'll, it'll follow the same kind of ideas. And so now I'm going to start editing files. Uh, for all of you, if you don't have SSH tunneling yet set up, you can just sort of navigate to the correct folder and you know you could open up into the project tab if you're using Atom or not. I'm going to be using the remote edit. So I will connect to the server here. 
I will find the folder in which my app lives and I will make a few changes. I'm going to go into my model, open up the product model. This is the model that automatically connects to and gives me access, uh, ORM or object relational mapping access to my products table. I can also add validations here. So I can validate that the, uh, say like the name and the price both have a presence of true. I can also validate that the price has a numericality of true. You could buy true. You could make like uniqueness uh, so that like you don't have multiple products with the same name. So you could say validates name. True. I think I have got all those correct. Uh, if we, you know, if you ever want to confirm your validations, of course, you can go to the Rails validation guide for that. I can also do a quick test to see if those validations are working by going to one of my tabs here and opening up the Rails console or Rails C. And I can now interact with the product model. I can do a product.count. I could do a product.create. Uh, and when you do a product.create, it tries to save that product uh, immediately. Now, it won't because of my validations, but I have this object where I can uh, look at the products errors.messages to see what the errors were. And you can see that the error message happening here, or the error messages happening here, is that the name can't be blank, uh, the price can't be blank, and the price cannot be a number. So it looks like my validations are good to go. And this might be a time where I might want to do some creation of products in my database. In the past, you've seen me do that from the, the console here, but we're going to do it a slightly different way, just so I can show you multiple ways of adding uh, initial products to our database. And so over here, I'll add my validations to git. And then over in my app itself, in the DB folder, there is a seeds.rb file. And it's in this file that you can put any kind of create statements that you would like to have seeded into your database. So let's say you're setting an application where in development mode you always want some test data in your app. You could lay out what that test data is. So I could have a number of product.create statements in here. And then I can run the Rails DB seed command from the command prompt and have all of these create statements executed for me. And then this seeds.rb would be part of my uh, Git repo, so if other people grab this same project, they could then seed the DB with the same kind of stuff. The location of that file is in the DB folder. And so I'll just create a few products here. Some cream cheese. The description will be delicious cheese for your bagel. The price will be $3.34 exactly. 
And I will, for now, leave the URLs empty. And then I can grab these three lines and paste them a few times down below and make a few other products. There you go. So my store sells three products, cream cheese, shoe phones, and robot vacuums. We, we're very eclectic in what we, uh, what we sell. And so I've set up a name, description, and price for all three. between each one just for readability. So just putting these products into this file doesn't actually create the products. I still have to run the Rails DB seed command to have this file executed in the context of active record and have these products created. And so I can run that from this tab here, Rails DB seed. So you could also imagine that this type of seeding, you might have database tables that are configuration data. Maybe you need to get some initial administrative users into some database tables before uh, your application can run. Maybe you have some content that needs to be seeded into the database before the application can run. So the seeds file is where you put that, and then when it gets distributed to other members of your team or other users, they just have to run the dbc command, and the, their database will then be set up just like everyone else's. And back from my console, I can check to see if that worked by running my product.count, and I should see that I have three products, and if I do product.all, I can see that all three products are now part of my database. The only thing that was left out was that image URL is nil in all three cases. We'll get to that later. And back over to git, git add, git commit, uh, added three <coughs> product create statements to the seeds.rb file. And just like with the previous demos, I'll put this git repository up on GitHub so that you can sort of see these incremental commits over time if you want to see how I built this this application up piecewise. Okay, so a lot of that we've done before. The seeds is slightly new, but it doesn't bring in too much more information. We're still just interacting with active record. Uh, any questions before I proceed? Yours did not work? Did it give? <coughs> Rails aborted? Yeah. At what point? So you may have created your seed file in such a way that it failed uh, one of your validations. And so did you, because remember we ensured that like the, the name and the description had to exist and the price had to be decimal, so is there a chance that you potentially uh, failed a validation on any one of those fronts? Yeah, I got that the other day too. Uh, 
under. That's what I had to do, yeah. But you don't have to like delete files or anything. Delete files, sorry. Yeah, the files should all be fine. Yeah. Or delete your Okay, well, James, we can look into that. If you can't figure it out, we can look into that a little bit later. So, again, we're, we're, we've done this aspect here. We've created a model. I now want to create a controller uh, with some routing and some associated views. Uh, I would like to, to have two different things happen. So, uh, I'm going to map out just in this notepad here sort of the routes that I, I want to, to exist within my application. Each route is going to have like an HTTP verb associated with it, a URL associated with it. Maybe I'll do some tabs here. And I would like those to be mapped to a particular uh, controller and a particular action within said controller. And initially, the way I want this set up is I would like uh, a get request to slash products to load up the soon to be created products controller and execute its index action. And I would also like there to be a route for a get request to slash products slash some number, which that number will represent the primary key of a product and I would like that to go to the products controllers show. Now the action names here, index and show, those are Rails conventions. If we have a page that lists sort of a summary of uh, a collection of database items, we call that thing the index. If we have a page that shows an individual uh, row from a database table, we call it a show. And the, there's sort of names for the types of routes. The type of route that an index represents is a collection. And the type of route that the show represents is a member route. And the difference between the two is that member routes will always specify some ID in the URL, so to pinpoint a particular member in a collection. And the collection routes will just show a collection, whether that's all or some subset of all. So those are the two types of routes that we will always be building, collection routes and member routes. And here I've just put as a placeholder for the number a hash mark, but instead I'm gonna just reference like the symbol ID, referencing that that's what that actually is. It's going to be the primary key ID of a particular product. The other thing I'd like to demonstrate is the fact that you can have multiple routes go to the same controller action. So although I want the ability to go to slash products and see the collection, uh, which is all my products, which will be loaded up by my products index action, I'd also like just the root route slash to go to the same location. And this is just to demonstrate that we can have multiple routes that go to the same place, which gives us some flexibility in terms of our application. Uh, remember, like when we were working in Web Dev 2, uh, our URLs almost always mapped directly to file paths and actual file names. Now we've sort of disentangled that. Our routes are just URLs that we map to particular controller actions, and so you can have the same controller action mapped to in different ways. So those are the routes that I want to set up. Uh, before I can start routing to the products controller, I need a products controller. And I know off the hop that it's going to have a index action and a show action. And so from my command prompt, I can generate it. Rails G controller. The name of this controller is going to be products, plural. That's also a convention. If you are building a controller that maps to a particular table in your database, you name the controller after that table. 
And so I have a products controller and that's going to be giving me information from the products table. And I know already that it's going to have an index action and a show. And so I can put those directly after. Those are optional. If I leave those out, I just get an empty controller. If I include those, what's going to be generated for me is two uh, methods in the products controller, just empty methods named index and show. Uh, the routing file will have some simple routes in them, uh, which we will then remove, but there, there will be some simple routes set up to route to those two actions. And there'll be files in the view folder for the associated views. And so we can see just that happen. We've got the products controller was created, two routes were added, uh, a new view folder was created named after the controller. So we now have an app views products folder. And in it, we have a index.html.rb and a show.html.rb. So th those are views for our two actions. And then we also have some assets and some tests that were created. So I can add that and commit it. Added the products controller with I can close my seeds.rb file, and there's a few files that I wish to open up now. I'm going to open up that products controller. You can see it has the index and the show action already in there. I'm going to go to the config folder and open up the routes.rb file. And you can see here, there's two different routes that were placed in this file already. And I'll explain sort of the details of those routes in a moment. And then there's also the two view files that are pertinent here, which are in the views products folder. There's an index and a show. And they've got information in them already. The index just has the name of the products controller and the fact that this is the index view and it has a location. So when we load this up in the web browser, if we didn't already know where it was located, it would tell us it's, oh, the location of this file is app views products. Same thing goes for show. So just we have some information stubbed out in there, which we can eventually delete. Uh, at this point, you'd probably want to restart your server. I don't have to because I'm doing my SSH base um, editing, but to restart your server, you just need to do a control C in the server tab and then rerun fail server. Yeah, I found that anytime you mess around with controllers, you have to restart. The controllers need restarts, the routes need restarts. Uh, there's, there's some configurations that we can change to make it so that the controllers don't need restarts. We can force Rails in development mode not to cache controller classes, uh, but the routes will then still always require a restart. And what I can see now is I can already see these things in action. There's not too much that they're going to do for me, but I now have some routing in place. I have a controller in place. I have some views in place. A layout has been created for me already. So this piece of the puzzle, this sort of loop here where a URL can come in, the router picks it up, it routes to a controller action, hands the data off to a view, goes to a layout and sends back HTML. All of that will already work and we can see it in action. If I wanna see which routes exist in my system, I can run the rails routes command from the command line. And I can see that there are two routes that exist. And the routes are defined, uh, each one has a name or they call it a prefix. And so I have my products index and my product show prefix. Each one of these routes responds to a particular HTTP verb. In this case, they're both get routes. Each one of them has a particular URI or URL pattern and a controller action that they want to route to. They're not quite set up how I wanted them to be. So currently, 
to load up the products index action, we have to go and make a get request to slash products slash index, where I would actually like a get request to just straight up slash products to, to do the same thing. And for show, a get request to slash product slash show will load that up, doesn't yet mention a placeholder for the ID. And so the, the default routes that are provided to me, I'm going to remove those and create some of my own. But let's see these in action. So let's go to the server and make a get request to slash product slash index, and then make a get request to slash product slash show. And what should happen at that point is I should see these two views being displayed. Because if you remember, what happens at the end of each action is that, you know, after this action, the associated view will automatically loaded and any instance variables will be shared with this view and in the case of the index the the associated view is going to be in the app views products folder so the named after the controller and then the view will be named after action whereas with the show the associated view is going to be show nothing happening in here yet eventually we're going to make calls to our model there so heading over to the browser based on what I know about my routes from running that rails routes command I should be able to go to slash product slash index and see the placeholder text in that index view. There it is, products index, find me in the app, use products index.html. That is from here. Slash product slash show. Shows me this. It's the same thing that's happening in this view file. And if we view source, you can see we've got, you know, our full HTML document inside of there from the layout. Okay, so there's a few things I want to do. One, I want to fix up the routing. So I'm going to remove these existing routes, but before I do, I'll explain how to read them. Starting with which HTTP verb is going to trigger these routes. So in both cases, the HTTP verb that triggers these routes is a get. And then when you define a route with just a single string with a slash in it, this defines not only the URL, but also by convention, which controller and which action are going to be executed. So a URL of slash product slash index will load up the products controllers index action. You can also, uh, if you want to sort of step outside conventions or be more explicit about your, how things are defined, we could say that that path is mapped to the products index action. And that this one is mapped to the uh, products show action. And by being explicit about where they're routing to, I can now change the pathing over here uh, to what I had wanted originally which was I wanted slash products to go to the products index action. So I can just remove the slash index here. And so the way again to read this is this is the, uh, this is the HTTP verb. This is the, uh, the URI, so the path portion of the, uh, of the URI. And then this is which controller and which action. And the control and the action are always separated by hash marks. Same thing here. Verb, URL, or URI, and then controller action. This one, I'd said I didn't want it to be slash product slash show. I wanted to have the user be able to click on links that had 
numeric values in them. And so I will put a placeholder there just using the symbol ID to represent the fact that that's going to be a placeholder for the ID. I can save this file. You'll now have to restart your server. I can test to see if those routes have been picked up by Rails. So running the Rails routes command, I will now see that I have a get request to slash products opens up the or maps to the products index action and a get request to slash products slash some ID will go to the product show action. Before I had prefixes for both of them, now I just have prefixes for one. So if I want to give each one of these things a name or a prefix, again being sort of more explicit about it, I can call this one products. That can be my products route. So I say as to give it a name and as product. So throughout my application, I can now refer to this route. I can refer to it as the products underscore path. And I can refer to this route over here. Let me grab this product underscore path. So that's going to be helpful for me when I'm going to be setting up URLs that are going to link to these various routes, because that's effectively what we always want to do with our routes, is we're going to want to link to them from different parts of our application. We're not going to expect our users to interact with our application by just typing in URLs. We're going to expect them to be sort of clicking, filling out forms. And so within my views, I, I'm going to be able to link to this products path and link to this product path. The important part about linking to the product path is that when I make use of this product path inside of my views, I'm also going to have to specify which product to link to because the URL is going to need to have an ID in it. OK, that means I should be able to head on over to my web application and check to see if these routes updated, so slash products should load up that view for my index action, and they do, and slash products slash some numeric value should go to the show. Notice it's not product singular slash four, it's products. So Rails uh, makes use of a convention called REST, or representational state transfer. Uh, and the URLs that we make when we're making RESTful URLs, uh, the initial portion of our URL that in our case references a particular table in our database, it's always the pluralized thing. And so when we're going to our collection, it's slash products. And then when we're going to a member, it's going to still be slash products, but the member is going to be some numeric value or like product one or product two or product 56. And those will all go to my show. Back over here, I can git add and git commit uh, fixed up the required routes. The missing piece of the puzzle here is that the model hasn't been invoked yet. I need to go to my model and for the index action, load up all of the products. And then for the show action, load up the particular product, the particular member that I want to display. And then the view is going to have to be responsible for displaying that information. So I can do that over at the controller. I'll start with the index action. This is going to say products equals product.all. So there's my model call to load up all my products. If I wanted to, I could do something like put in an order clause. So that'll find all the products and then order them alphabetically by name. 
In either case, I am saving that data to a instance variable called products with an at symbol in front of it because it's an instance variable and that will be automatically shared with my view. Which means over in the index view, I can fix this up so it's just products and I can toggle into ERB mode to say that this products uh, each do so for each of those products temporarily create a product uh, and for my block and then inside of there I could do something like well an h2 for echoing out the product name inside of a paragraph tag I could echo out the product uh, description inside of another paragraph tag I could mention the product price and echo out the product dot price there nice little loop so for every one of the products, I'm going to be looping over this block of HTML slash ERB. And so we have three products in our database. So there will be three products in this collection. Hence, this block will be executed three times, meaning I should get three H2s, each one with the product's name, three of these paragraph tags with the descriptions inside of them, and then three of these paragraph tags with the word price in bold, followed by the actual product price. And so I'll come back to that in a, in a moment, but just again, this is we've now sort of covered off all paths in this flow. We have a route, which is going to be slash products that'll map to my controller's index action. It will then go to the model, fetch the products, bring that back to the controller, hand that data off to the view. The view will make use of ERB to render that HTML, then the rendered HTML will be injected into a layout which will then be served back to the end user. Meaning that I should be able to go to slash products and see all those things. At this point you will likely have to restart your server because you've made changes to your controller. And so there, there are three of my products. I should have, uh, it would have been better for me to have made one of these prices something like uh, you know, $3.30 so that we could see that this number would just be formatted as a float. We would see, you know, if this was $3.30, we would just see 3.3. And then I could demo for you what a uh, little helper that Rails has at its disposal. I can, I can make that change over in the console here. So I can grab the cheese by going to product.first. I can change the cheese price to be $3.30. And then I can save the cheese. Back over here, we can see that the price is now just displayed as 3.3. That's not what we want, right? We would like these things to be displayed as numbers, or sorry, currencies, more, more specifically. Rails gives us all sorts of helpers that we can use uh, for things like that. So I can do my number to currency helper to turn that price into a currency. So this is a call to the number to currency helper. Uh, optionally, you can put curly braces around it. That might be a little bit more familiar in that you're passing the product price to the number to currency helper. Uh, most Rails programmers, you won't see the, uh, the parentheses. You'll just see it like looking like that. 
And if I reload the page, you can see all of those things are now displayed as numeric values. They get a dollar sign in front of them. And the 3.3 now has the padded zero at the end of it. Yes? If that's built into Rails, how would you change what currency that is? Uh, the number to currency helper probably supports that. So we could go to the Rails API and look up the number to currency helper. Okay, like if it was to do pounds or pence or something? Yeah, yeah. Like would you just pass a second parameter maybe? Or? Let's see. Number to currency, which is a number helper. Yeah, you would set the locale to be used for formatting. And so, for example, here, their example, they when they set the locale to France or FR, uh, you now have euros. But not only that, uh, in Europe, they don't use, uh, they use commas for, as a decimal point, right? So it also knows about that. So now this same dollar value has been formatted with the comma for the decimal point and the, the euro symbol has been put in afterwards. And so Rails supports uh, a bunch of different locales, not only for currency, but also for like internationalization. So you can take all your strings and put them into a uh, internationalization file and then you can reference them uh, by name and then you can have translations and things like that as well. But we're just going to assume the default, it'll, uh, it'll likely default to the US locale. Uh, and so we could probably also set it to Canada, but I don't think that won't change anything in how it'll be displayed. So locale uh, CA. Valid locale, what is it? CND? I'm, I'm just guessing now. CDN? Yes, that would make more sense. No. So it's like, I, I obviously would have to look up what the actual locale for Canada is. Okay, any other questions or comments about this, right? I've now got my controller loading up my products and I'm looping through them here. So I can save this now to Git. Check out what my differences are. Yeah, Git add, Git commit, loading all products by name in the products index action. And now I want to go through the same thing for the show. The show's a little trickier in that the route involved, it's a member route, so it involves an ID. This already works to a certain extent, right? I can go to slash product slash some number and I'll, I'll see the, the show. But I need to get this number into my controller action so that I can use it to look up the correct product from the model and then display that here within the view. So how do we go about doing that? Well, inside of the show here, I want to load up a particular product. I want to save it into an instance variable so it'll be handed off to the view. When I want to look up a product by ID, I use the find method. And initially I'll just hard code it to the number one. So irregardless of you know what number is going to be put into the URL, the first product is always going to be loaded. And in the show here, I can say like, you know, this is going to show a particular product. What I can do here is I'll do a little bit of copy paste from 
my other view. In subsequent classes, we'll look at how to remove this kind of repetition from our views, but for now, we'll be fine with like taking these five lines here and pasting them over to here. Oops, almost missed that. The only thing that I need to worry about is I don't have access to a product variable. I have access to an at product variable because that's what the controller made available to me. In the index, it was product because that was my block parameter. So I need to put at in front of all three of references to that product. So now going to slash products slash some number should have us load up the first product and show it in the view. So slash product slash some number, doesn't matter what the number is right now, we see cream cheese. So it doesn't matter if it's a one or a 999. It also doesn't matter if it's like a wat, wat, wat. Some product slash anything is always gonna load up this particular thing. You're not able to find at product.name. Is it an error on nil class or is it an error on at product? If it's an error on nil class, that means you didn't uh, properly load up the product in the show, which might just mean you need to restart your server. So now you can see why this whole restarting the server thing is super annoying and why we'll, we'll get to how to get around that a little bit later. Okay, so this isn't so helpful. I'm always just loading up product number one. I want to load up the product that was specified by ID in the route. And we've got a placeholder here called ID right in that route. If this was a PHP application, we would use a get parameter, right? We'd have question mark ID equals some ID. Uh, we would use the get super global to access that ID. We would check that ID to ensure that it was numeric and then we would hand it off to the database. In Rails, instead what we do is we have this thing called the params hash which if you are a PHP programmer, you can think of it as a combination of the get super global and the post super global. So all get and post data ends up inside of the params hash. What do I want specifically? I want the ID. And I can call it ID because that's what the placeholder was called in my route. So if the placeholder was called something else, then we could reference that something else. We want to use ID, again, because of convention. That's what the ID is called in the database table. And so we will use ID here to reference it, and we will use ID here to reference it. And so now I should be able to go to slash product slash some ID, and this should still be cream cheese. But if I go to number two, I should actually see a different and if I go to number three, I don't have a fourth product. That's fine. In development mode, I get this big red active record not found, couldn't find product with ID four. In production mode, I would get a 404. So Rails will automatically capture the active record, record not found exception and it will display the 404 page for me in production mode because we wouldn't want our end users seeing like snippets of our code, right? Can you do a custom 404? You can do a custom 404, yeah. The other problem is, you know, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Couldn't find product with ID, wah, wah, wah. I don't really want strings being thrown to active record. I would really like this just not even to map to the route. I don't want my route to be slash product slash anything. I want my route to be slash product slash some numeric thing. And so again, in PHP, we would have done this after the fact with like sort of babysitting the, the application by like asking if the 
ID and the get request was numeric, and if it was or it wasn't, we would do things. In Rails, I can do this at the routing level. I can add a constraint to my route to ensure that this ID is only permitted to be numeric and that the route will not match if it's something non-numeric. And so I do that by adding yet another named parameter here. So we have two for the controller and the action, as for the name, and now I'm gonna take that ID and I'm gonna constrain it to be a regular expression. So we define regular expressions in Ruby with forward slashes and the regular expression for a numeric value, well you could do something like zero through nine, uh, one or more of those things, but zero through nine has a shortcut in regular expressions which is slash D. The plus operator in regular expressions means one or more of the thing that it is modifying. And so we're asking here for one or more digit. And so this route now will only match URLs that are slash product slash one or more numeric digit. Uh, let's go see, it won't handle decimals, no. Because I didn't specify that I was allowing uh, periods or commas in my, in my regular expression. So now, slash product slash wat wat wat. That will give me a routing error, which again in, in production mode will show a 404, but it's not trying to hit my database with wat wat wat. Uh, you, never want to you never want in a web application to allow strings into your database where you're not expecting them because that is an attack vector for SQL injection attacks. But slash one works, slash three works. I still have this issue where if the product doesn't actually exist, but that's fine, right? Again, in production mode, that'll show a 404, but we're no longer routing to the show action if it's slash product slash something else. It only will route when that something else is numeric and it won't allow you know, decimal values either. Oh, interesting. In this case, it probably took the point two as a file extension or a type extension. Because notice it's still just looking for four. So it's expecting this to be like the format, the requested format. So I can now capture all of this in Git. The fact that I'm finding my product by ID and constraining the route and displaying the product by ID. And uh, get commit minus M. Just constrained the ID in the show route to be numeric load and display the appropriate product. So now I have my two routes in my system. Slash products is my index. Slash product slash some number is the show. Still though, I'm forcing my user or me to interact with my application by way of URLs. It's not really what I want, right? I want the users to be able to click on things. Uh, perhaps it would be nice for there to be a link provided with each one of these products. Maybe on the home page we don't show the details, we just show the name, and then when you click through to an individual product, maybe there you see the details. We can at least we can we can mock that out here. So in my index, I'll, I'll get rid of the description and the price. And what I want from here is inside of a paragraph tag, I'd like to have some kind of A with an href that will link to the details. Details. Uh, 
and then over on the show page, it might be nice to be able to like go back to the products page. And so it might be nice to have an a href here that goes like back. Currently, I've left the href attribute empty in both those cases. So there's the back that's going to be displayed on each show page. There's a details link that's going to be displayed with each product. But currently, neither of them are actually linking anywhere. But we can see that in action here. There's my various products with their detail links. Clicking on them, of course, does nothing because I didn't put hrefs in there. And if I go to an individual product, I can see the back button. It's also not doing anything yet. So one way to solve this problem would be to hard code in the correct URLs, right? So in the show, I could say, well, I know that it's slash products. And over here in the index, I could say, well, I know it's slash products slash some ID, where that ID is the product ID. Again, in like plain old PHP, this is exactly what we would do, right? We would manually craft our href by echoing in the required information. And over here, we would manually, manually craft this thing here. This will work, right? So I, if I go over here, reload my page, my back now takes me back, my details now take me to the right places. But we have lost some of the real flexibility of routing, which is the fact that at any time, if I want to change the URL uh, of a particular route, I can. Say I really wanted, uh, for sort of Google juice purposes, for like SEO, I wanted my route to be like cheap products. I can change it in my routing file. I can go over here and cheap products now loads up the products. But I can't click this back button anymore because that products path doesn't exist. So I'm not properly dealing with my routing by hard coding in this information. What I want instead is to use another helper. So we saw up here that I could use a number to currency helper to format a currency. I'm going to now use a link to helper to build a link that's going to route to a particular route for me. And this is why I gave my routes names. And so the as means that for this products route, I can refer to the products route as products underscore path. So it's whatever this as was defined as with an underscore path at the end of it. So over here, I can link to, I want the link text to read back, and I want it to link to the products path. That will make the A with the correct href for me. And now if I was to change the, the routing, it'll update itself. And I won't have to worry about editing any of my views if my routing changes. So you gain some flexibility there in that you can completely restructure the URLs uh, that you're routing without making any updates to your view. So if I go over here, reload this page, You'll have to reload your server and go back and forth between them. If I now go and change my URL to cheap products, you don't have to bother doing that. I'll just demo it for you. If I reload this page here, clicking the back button now takes me to cheap products rather than just plain old products. So you gain a lot of flexibility if you don't hard code these things in, if you work with the routing system, if you work with link to, if you name your routes and you refer to them by name. And so I can put this back to products. So that's one direction that's linking to the products path. 
So that's when we're using a collection route. It's very simple. You just give the link text and the path. The other directions are slightly more complicated because it's a member route. We need to specify not only the name of the route, which in this case is as product, but in order for Rails to build the route, it needs to build the route with a numeric identifier in it, so it needs to know which product it is routing to. And so when I am building this link with link to, I can still give it like details for the link text, and I can still reference the fact that I'm wanting to link to the product path. That's the name I gave this route. But I also have to hand off to that product path which product I'm working with. And it can go and grab the ID. And again, that's why convention. So in my route, I have a parameter called ID. In this thing that I pass to the product path, it has an attribute called ID. And so the routing system can pull the ID attribute and use it for the ID parameter in the generated route. You likely could do it if you specified that the ID was the product ID. That would work as well. And the truth is, is that this is such a common pattern in Rails, and I have stuck to conventions uh, very strongly. So I can literally just do this, link to details product. And so I'm just passing this directly to link to, and it'll go and look, well, OK, you gave me an object of type product. Do you have a route called product? Oh, you do. The thing you gave me has an ID, so that's cool too. And I'll just build the, the correct link for you. So this is the absolute short form. I'll put both in, in here. So we can either do the long form, which is specifying the product path and where to get the, the ID. You could do the long, long form, where you specify that I know that an ID is required and you can find it in the product ID. And the absolute short form is that. All three of them are going to generate the same. And so again, this is Rails's convention over configuration. This is the convention. And if we started to build an application that sort of sat a little bit outside of conventions, where maybe my placeholder or even maybe I was working with a legacy database where the ID wasn't actually the name of the column, I could you know start configuring the application to work with that legacy uh, database that sort of goes outside of conventions. So here's the conventional way of doing it, a little bit more explicit, very explicit. All three of them will generate the same link. Oh, except for, uh, I changed my route back to just products. So if we went and viewed source, you'd see in all three cases, the generated routes are identical. They all have details as the link text. They all go to slash product slash the ID of the thing in question. You can see the IDs are out of order because I ordered the products by name, not by ID. And so over here, I'll just put a little HTML comment in here. Three different ways to So there's a few other things that I would like to do. 
Uh, one is that I said very early on that I wanted to give a demonstration of the fact that we could have multiple routes mapping to the same location. So here we have this index of the products controller being mapped to by slash products. In the last, when we did our Pokemon, we also saw that we could set up like a default route for no path at all, which was the root route. So I can have a root route go to the products index. And so now there's two ways to get at that index. I can either go to slash products or I can just go to you know, no path at all by way of this root. If I run my Rails routes commands here, you can see that I have my various routes, my root route, which is slash, my slash products route, my slash products has some ID. I see my constraint there. I see which controller actions they route to, two of them mapping to the same index action. In here, I can go from one to the other. How would you add the products back in on the root path? Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, that should still work. Like, oh, like how you could like redirect? Yeah. Yeah, the, in Rails you would probably do it by way of a redirection. So you could map, in, when setting up the, the root route, if you really wanted there to, there to be like a canonical route, uh, then you would, you would do a redirect rather than an than a actual load. But yeah, there'd be no way of adding it in uh, sort of it would just be one or the other. And we could also have like, we could have many different routes that link to the same thing, right? Again, so like if you had like for search engine optimization reasons or for like some kind of marketing reasons, you could have like super cheap products go to the same place. And so now I could go to like slash super cheap products. I, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, what doesn't it like? You already, oh, now I've named two products, to name two things with the same name, so it's not liking that. Temporarily, I'll fix my problem. Okay. Save this to get, get add, get commit, minus M, added a root route to the products index. Again, with conventions, all of this is sort of the explicit way of defining routes where I'm specifying explicitly the verb, the URL, the controller action, and the names. Truthfully though, I don't have to do that. Instead, all I have to do inside of my routing file is say resources, products. And what that will do for me is uh, this will generate the seven default restful routes. If I go and run Rails routes here, we'll see that I have a whole bunch of routes here, more than I actually need. So the seven restful routes 
are all the routes that you were required to make a CRUD application. So there's a route for a collection route for the index. Oops, sorry. A collection route for the index, uh, a place to put a new form, a place to receive posted information about that new form, uh, a place to route to a edit form. Uh, for backwards compatibility reasons, there's two different uh, places to send the data from the edit form, and then a place to route to when you wish to delete a particular member. So you can see some of these are member routes, they have IDs in them. Some of them are not member routes, they don't have IDs in them. You can also see that we're using more HTTP verbs than you're probably used to. So not only are we making use of get and post, but you can see patch, put, and delete verbs are also being used here. Uh, web browsers, web servers support all of these various route uh, verbs. Web browsers don't. So web browsers only understand get and post. Web servers can actually respond properly to all of these verbs. Uh, so when we set up routes that make use of, say, the patch or the put or the delete, uh, Rails sort of takes them out. And we'll talk about how Rails takes them out later. I don't actually need all these. I'm not building a full CRUD application. I just want the uh, resources associated with the index and the show. And so I can just ask for only the index and the show. In. You will uh, require you only the index and show in the multiple? Yes. Yeah. So it'll only, yeah, it'll only, like, if I, do you mean, like, if I do this now? Rails routes? Or. Because now it'll only show those two. The other rest of them have just gone away. Is that what you were asking or not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, now it's restricted. I've only built up these two different one collection route and one show route. They happen to look exactly like what I had defined before, but only because I know the convention. So I built up these explicitly defined routes in a way that actually matched the conventions of what Rails would provide for me. So when you're making a Rails application, you want to try to think of everything in terms of RESTful routes so you can lean on the generation of those RESTful routes. If you start to go outside of those seven possible restful things, like our create, read, update, and delete, where both create and update have two routes associated with each. Uh, if you sort of drift outside those conventions, you could start to manually map out routes that go outside those norms. But when working with a Rails application, it's very common to try to build everything around your seven restful routes. There's nothing wrong with manually defining them, but when you have access to a nice little general life generator like that, it's a nice thing to do. And so I can, uh, my with these in place, my application should still just work like before. So I should be able to go to slash. I should be able to click on any one of these details links. And here I'm always going back to slash products. If I wanted the back button to go to the, to the root route, I could edit the show view and have it go to the root path rather than to the products path. So I could edit here. This could be root path instead of product path if I wanted that to be the canonical sort of back. And I think that is enough information on the Rails front for the day. One second, I'll answer the question. I'll just save this stuff into uh, replaced our custom index and show routes with resources. <laughs> okay. And so your question? Oh, for auth, you typically don't 
put guard. I mean, there are ways to add authentication uh, guarding into routes, but it's typically done more in the controller. And so you would have uh, what we're going to look at later on in the course, which are called like before actions, things you want to happen before actions occur. And th that would be uh, where you could sort of shim in some authentication. And so Rails supports like really simple like HTTP basic auth where you get like the browser that pops up that little browser box that asks for a username and password. That's really, that's a single line that we could add into our controller. Uh, but you can also have like a whole, you know, full blown uh, you know, registration slash authentication system that you build in your system, or there's a whole bunch of gems that you can use to, to build those kind of things as well. Um, yeah, I think that's where I will leave this video. So, stop.